first of all, good afternoon, and thanks for letting me come here and, and talk to you. Um, the, the quick thing is, first of all, this is the perfect theater stage for me I mean, because this is one third of my personal library. It's about 2,500 books. So I feel perfectly aligned with this here. Um, I'm out of California. I'm owned by three cats um, <laughs> and a wife, yes, inside of that. Uh, I've been open source before. It was open source starting with Linux 093. And two years ago, I was fortunate enough to be named as one of the top pioneers in open source space. Uh, so what I'm going to do a little bit is talk about RED. RED is a concept that talks about how you can approach looking at your monitoring structures and why we need to go deeper inside of here. But I wanted to start with a simple quote. This is out of, out of Sherlock Holmes, of course. You see, but you do not observe. Because if you're only looking at one level or one dimension, you're missing the entire picture inside of here. And you're missing the ability to dive deep and look at the fidelity of the images inside of that. So to talk a little bit about this, we need to talk a bit about observability. And we start off with the fact that observability is very honestly, it's a signal to noise problem. But it's not. It's treated as a signal not noise problem. And there are basically two ways of reducing noise. The first one is very simple. Don't send as many signals into it. And that'll give you a very clean signal when it's coming in, but it doesn't let you have the rest of the information inside of here. The other one is bring all the signals in and filter on the back end. And that will help you clarify the signal while still allowing you to get the data that's inside of here. There's a fairly famous encryption scheme where they would send messages, and in the front of the message, there's a little bleep. And all the bleep was, sounds like noise to everybody else, was the actual encoded message. So if you didn't save that piece, you had no chance of ever encoding, decoding what was going on inside of that. So it's a signal, not noise problem, not a signal to noise problem. Observability, talked about a lot these days, but it really comes down to what is your system doing based on what you can see? And it allows you to infer the internal behaviors. You can't actually know what's happening inside of that to the same point in time, but the thing you have to remember is observability is designed to let you answer the unknown questions, or what's known as the unknown unknowns, the things you need to know long before you ever realize you need to know them. And it consists of a lot of pieces. Most commonly you hear it talked about are logs, monitoring, and event tracing. There's lots of other signals that come into play here. It has to cross all those boundaries, the application boundaries, the service boundaries. Kubernetes, for instance, adds four layers of infrastructure to your environment. You need to get all that data in one place inside here. And honestly, anything that slows you down is bad. Sorry, we think really fast. If you have to wait to figure out what you're going to think about next, it's not a good concept. So it's not just monitoring. I'm going to talk about monitoring, but observability is more than just monitoring. The problem with observability is that we haven't set up what we need to observe. And there are lots of potential signals that come into play here. The big three, logs, traces, uh, metrics inside of here. But there can be things like stack traces. There can be core dumps. There can be all sorts of stuff. We have a customer, believe it or not, who feeds their, their um, uh, Twitter feed into it because their customers always know something is going wrong long before it ever goes wrong. And they actually watch for customers to go out going, is something wrong? And that triggers them. It triggers an alert, and they actually go out and find what's happening. Signals are never static. So they're constantly moving, and they're constantly changing. So you'll also hear a lot about observability is around events. Everything is an event. For those of you who were unfortunate enough earlier on, you got to hear me do Hamlet's soliloquy. You got <laughs> to hear me talk about a little bit of poetry. It's an event. The rest of y'all, it never happened. Events are only important if they are observed and recorded. And so you have to be able to do that. Metrics are great. They're compact. They're efficient. And by gosh, we as people can pattern match with the best of them. We extrapolate. My degree is in statistics. I do life for a living for this. But nonetheless, metrics are great. Extrapolation is bad, but we're really good at this. Logs are full fidelity. They tell you everything that's going on, but they're bulky, and they can be hard to deal with inside of here. And in fact, in most of these places, you'll hear things like, I'm indexing things. 
The problem is if you don't index it, finding it can be really hard because we have so much volume inside of here. And then traces are cool, and they make logs look like a little bitty uh, storage system because on an average tra trace in a microservices environment, the average request can produce somewhere between 50 and 100 additional spans. So all of a sudden, what would be five or 10 log inches, it, issues is going to be closer to somewhere around 150 to 300. So those are the things that we look at today. So now we're going to step into RED. And RED is a spinoff of the golden signals out of Google. The Google SRE handbook talks about this. And Tom Wilkie, who at that time was with WeWorks, uh, came up with a subset that was designed for microservices-oriented architectures. And it turns out that that's not necessarily the only limiting factor. It is really great for anything that is request-driven. So any services-based or request-driven architecture, RED is a great fit for. It does not work well for batch jobs or completely 100% streaming type jobs or monolithic architectures. It's really designed for how you keep track of things through the entire life cycle, entire process of what's going on. So RED starts taking monitoring to this new level, what I call the Chuck Norris level inside of here. And RED allows me to get the rate error duration functionality to recognize the issue as well as to dig <coughs> in and recognize the root cause. So you can start looking at these things, and we have metrics that, that fit into those, but we also have the log capability inside of here. And traces actually cross the boundaries um, inside of here. Likewise, you can find the problems like I was talking about with Twitter feeds, likewise and stack traces, all those different things come together and manage to make this part of the, of the overall process. <coughs> Sorry, um, a week ago I was in Sydney, so my voice is kind of shot at this point in time. Uh, for this. So let's talk about RAID. RAID is the first part of this. And it is the size and number of requests going across your system. And RAID is really great because it will give you an overall picture of what's going on while allowing you to disaggregate into what is happening with any specific piece of that RAID structure. So now I can look at not only I've got all these, I've got hundreds of, of calls going through, but I can also start evolving down and say this specific call took this much time, or this specific call generated this activity. And so I start looking at those various things inside of here, and RAID gives me those things. And it also provides a measurement for the overhead. If you're using a service mesh, for instance, there's an overhead involved in using service mesh, SDO, Envoy, Linkerd, Concourse, any of those pieces in here. Any environment that can fail when you hit peak is a good candidate for a rate-oriented structure. So if you are going to have something where the speed and performance matters, you need to keep track of rate. So the standard Google survey, five seconds in e-commerce is a lost sale. 10 seconds is someone who will go complain to their friends about, about how slow you are. And that's the type of environment that we now live in. People are expecting to see results come back in half a second max. Um, it, the, the other number that I don't always quote is 3.2 seconds is 68% of all people will abandon a shopping cart. 3.2 seconds. So you need to look at what's happening in rate, but you also need to look at not only just the rate piece, but the individual access pieces. So for instance, I'm looking at a bandwidth curve up here. The two curves pieces, this one is, I think, my current summation and this is my maximum inside of here. But that doesn't tell me much. And so I need to be able to do the next level down, which RED sets up for me, because RED is a summation of metrics that can be de-aggregated here, is what is causing each of my pieces? Where is the data coming from? And how can I analyze at the server level, the infrastructure level, the application level, even down to the path level, what is happening with my RED structures? And what it will do, for instance, is identify um, interesting things, if I could see which one. I probably don't have it here. My, my focus, by the way, is a lot worse than those, I think, for here. But for instance, this one says image render, and this one says image, and this one says home. And if I look at this, for instance, over here, image one, two, and image one, I would expect images are big. Why is web server six so big? 
and that's a flag. That's a signal that the, that's being come given to you that something is going on. And if you continue down here, I didn't put them all in here, I have two web servers or three web servers that are really big and I have three web servers that are really small. And that tells me that my load balancer has got problems. And generally speaking, it's a configuration problem at this point in time. So Red can easily tell you what's happening at that level without you having to do a whole bunch of additional research or bring in all these other pieces. It starts from the top, drill into it. Errors, obvious, incorrect, incomplete, or unexpected results. It can be code violations, it can be production peak loads, it can be communication headaches, it can be lots of different pieces that happen inside of here. Errors need rapid response. If things are broken, you gotta fix it. Um, it also usually requires very point specific responses. It's not something that, that says, oh gosh, the problem is in my app server cluster. My app server cluster that I was showing you is seven app servers. It's not in my app server cluster. It's where is it happening? What is happening? And then start digging into it. Here we tend to use logs, either structured, semi-structured, raw, it doesn't matter. But we start looking at the data that happens inside of here. You need this deep dive fidelity. Red sets up the ability to look at this also from a complex viewpoint that says my error rate across my system is doing this. It compares to information about how things were working the last week or last month or last hour inside of here, but again has that same capability of driving in because again, I can disaggregate stuff inside of this. And generally speaking, when it happens, you better respond as fast as possible. This is what wakes people, you know, gets pages going off in the middle of the night. Um, you know, my team, for instance, when we look at this, when an alert goes off for our production system, the DevOps on call gets a page, the DevOps team gets a Slack notification, and the DevOps manager gets an email, all at the same time. Because these are things that cost business. So, using this as an error example here, I can see that I've got some interesting peaks that are happening inside of here. Again, doing a same breakdown, I can see what is causing that peak to happen. I didn't just color, decolor all of these things, but I've got this orange peak, which is right here, and that's actually probably the biggest single contributor to this model. I can then start dr drilling down. I can look at what it was week over week. Because I have a standard set of things I am measuring with the ability to find the things I didn't even think of to begin with, Red gives me a place to start. And Red gives me the ability to set something up and adapt to whatever the needs are inside of here. Not responding, uh, honestly, I'm in a DevOps conference, not responding is what makes us really unhappy. You know, people yell at us. When things break, people yell at us. Duration, it's all about time. And you'll hear a lot of this around the discussion of distributed request tracing or distributed tracing. And there are lots of things. Most distributed retracing these days, most DIRT, distributed request tracing, is based on the server side. The client side is, if not as important, possibly even more important than that. Because again, that response time curve comes into play here. It brings the events into to order. So you now know what order things happened in, and it can help you understand what the pathway through your system looked like. And that, honestly, will tell you things like, so do I even know it's slow? Last, or two weeks ago, we had this really interesting problem that showed up um, with my company's production product. Um, all of a sudden, the requests coming into our system started slowing down. Our bandwidth started dropping. This is unusual, doesn't usually happen. It's actually fairly constant and going slightly at all the times. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Nothing else reported. We had a bandwidth issue that was showing up here. What turned out was that a update to a service in our system invalidated one of the configuration controls which allowed us to control what happened when the <coughs> queue filled up. And what happened was the ingest engine basically filled its queue of 160 things, <coughs> headed it to the queuing system which filled its queue of 160 things which then told the load balancer, oh yeah, sure, keep sending them to me, and nothing was going through. Root cause turns out to be one of those rate issues that was up ahead. We had one customer who was sending us lots of transactions 
with very small data rates, the little tiny data pieces inside of here. So those pieces were backing up because the processing time doesn't really matter that much in terms of size. It's pretty fast, no matter if it's big or little. But because we had so much coming in here that this thing was overflowing. And the configuration change that showed up via, via this duration issue was actually being caused by another completely different problem, which wasn't even broken code. It was a broken configuration file. And so duration gives you some interesting aspects inside of that. And duration can be expressed in lots of different ways. Um, I started to throw a distributed tracing model up here. Um, there are sort of three common distributed tracing things. There are lots of them. But you'll hear open tracing, you'll hear open census, and now you hear open telemetry, which is the, the joining between open tracing and open census. Uh, open tracing is with the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Open um, census came out of Google. And open telemetry has its own little organization. We'll probably end up inside of CNCF as well. But you can obviously see real quick that there is a problem here. You can see quickly what happens in your metrics, that there's a long tail issue that's here. And if you really want to, you can actually see every single transaction and how long it took. So here's one that's really out of the ordinary. From here, you can start drilling into it in pieces. The reason for not showing a distributed trace model is that, as I had mentioned earlier, distributed tracing blows the amount of data out the window. Um, for, a, uh, for this request with open tracing, there's about 128 traces that are generated for basically eight lines of log files. So each piece matters. Here's the nice trick if you're in this space and you want to get into open trace or you want to get into tracing easily, you're in microservices or if you're in a service oriented model, look at service meshes. All the service message, those meshes in open source are already wired for distributed tracing. And that will give you the ability to see what's happening between service endpoints, which is actually, again, probably more important. Communication pathways and microservices take up the majority of the time. Microservices being written as small as necessary tend to not be the, the stumbling block in terms of time. So why red? Well, interestingly enough, um, one of those, the early things was I did spend 10 years as a soccer rep. Um, um, anybody who plays soccer, I'm sorry, but seeing red is, is, has a meaning to me as well. But it's easy to remember. So it's companions, golden signals, um, or use, utilization, saturation, and errors are equally in that same space. Red fits my world of microservices really well. So it fits this request-based model extremely well. It drives a standard and consistency without locking you rigidly into any activity. And so you can build whatever you want to within this framework of rate error duration for this and pretty much drive forward from that viewpoint. Start small. Start with the basics and then add to it as you discover the things that are unique around your application space. Almost every third party package will fall into this red category as long as, again, their request or service is driven <coughs> inside of here. So it's not a, a, a major headache. Interestingly enough, one of the things that it does help with a lot is automation of these functionalities. Because I am now looking at a standard environment. I can automate the same capabilities when I'm looking at the materials and information that Red is telling me. And so I'm no longer worried about what happens with this team here and how they produce code or this team here and how they produce metrics. I now have a common basis that allows me to automate that access together. And honestly, what we have found and what I've heard is that everyone um, has focused on is the user happiness. If things slow down, you have unhappy users. If things aren't working, you have unhappy users wherever they come from. And RED gives you a quick proxy, a quick look at this model that says, maybe my users are unhappy and maybe I should take a look at this. So coming up towards the end here, there are two types of alerts that happen. RED is used heavily in alerts. There can be anomaly alerts and there can be headache alerts. Anomalies are I've crossed a boundary or I've dropped in between a boundary or I've dropped below a boundary inside of here. Headaches are, it broke, go fix it inside of here. The issue with red and sort of the false metric piece that red can get you is that 
something that shows up as a headache or an anomaly may be caused by something totally different. So for instance, rate can be caused by an error problem, my earlier example for that. Bandwidth can end up as an error problem because I've got a slow consumer problem and I can no longer get the data because my bandwidth is out there. In duration, something isn't responding, can show up as an error, or it could show up as rate. So rate crosses the boundaries and you need to be careful that you're not hitting a false positive indicator when it's actually not there. So as a quick example, this is a, a red chart, rate error duration. It's broken down by the service. This is actually my current backend environment. The marketing piece, my, honestly, is product structure pieces. They're queue pieces. And we're indicating here what the change in reflection is, the error pieces inside of here. We're showing you what happened over the last week over week basis. So it's a huge amount of information in a very quick. The darker the reds, the more the errors are showing up. Yellows are in the lukewarm category. There's a pale green that's not showing up on the screen that basically says things are actually getting better. So rate has an easy way of being expressed, a very visual method, method for expressing it, and so forth. There is a zen around this, for this, and this is the observability zen. From the customer, is it working or not? Is it fast or not? And that's pretty much it. For the people who are keeping it working, there's more than that. There's the latency, there's the rates, there's the concern, currencies, and how you're doing on system components and how they respond to it. So philosophy, um, I, was a, I ran a nonprofit for Stanford on philosophy. Um, it's impossible to get two tenured professors of philosophy to agree on anything uh, for this. Instrumentation by itself is not an answer. It can help you find an answer, but it's not an answer here. Metrics are powerful, but they're not solely sufficient. Metrics can be aggregated, they cannot be disaggregated here. Your job is to look at the work, not the service, but look at the service anyway. In particular, look at how the work affects the service inside of here. And your goal is not observability, that's an attribute. Your goal is mean time to recognition and mean time to resolution. Red will help you get there. So, short, observability is more than monitoring, but we start with monitoring inside of here. Red can work in strange and mysterious ways to give you all sorts of information. Be careful that the information you're looking at is the information you expect to see here. And use all your signals. If you've got Twitter feeds, figure out how to bring them in and set up the, that as one of your signals for moving forward in observability. And with that, I think I've got a few minutes for questions. <clears throat> So the best way to, to integrate, so the, repeating the question so they can pick it up on the, the mic here, how do you integrate into an existing model? Um, it, the existing models can be APMs, the existing models can be log management, the existing models can be tail, F, and grep, any of those things here. Interestingly enough, there are two ways to approach this. One is a straightforward metrics model. Bring in the metrics that happen, happen with this. Um, I suggest, for instance, if, I'm, if I was doing this from scratch right now, I'd be looking heavily at Prometheus. Uh, because it has a standard way of producing metrics. But if you're looking at it just bringing it into an APM type model, you're actually pretty much there. You've got the data, you need to sort the data in a different way for this. Um, if it's not, if you're not in that, that particular type of model here, um, there are a number of tools that will pull out red from almost every single third party package. And so take a look at what your packages are Grab, you know, grab your favorite Grafana instance and I bet you you can already go to a red model. The headache is, is that you're not going to be able to do really good drill in unless you do the fidelity up roll. And that's a challenge. So is how, well actually let me phrase that a little bit. How does this relate to telemetry? The terms actually get used a lot. We hear both signals telemetry as well as this observability. The concept of observability from the old machine days actually came out of a telemetry model. And it is, it is pretty much the same concept applied to application digital involvement. It's, it's really scarily close for that. So you know, if, some, if you've ever worked on an analog computer, um, this would, would have made your, your hair stand on end, but you would have loved it. Um, OK, so uh, can, can you just go just a little bit more detail? Um, are you directly involved with, uh, they finally picked a name, Open Tracing? Is that right? So Open Tracing actually started with 
oh, shoot, oh, shoot, another company and was given to CNCF. Uh, so it's been a CNCF uh, incubating project since, I want to say, 2016, 2017. Uh, we got involved. I've been I, I, uh, I'm fascinated by distributed tracing until I look at the amount of data it produces. So I actually do a talk on distributed tracing as well. Um, distributed tracing, the, the difference between those three that I kind of talked about, tracing, census, and telemetry, um, tracing defined sort of the API of how you got traces. Okay? <coughs> Open census defined both an API and an engine to actually show you and drive down what the traces were. And telemetry is to bind the APIs together so that people who have already written open tracing stuff don't have to rewrite. So those are the three categories inside of here. In general, just throwing my <coughs> tracing hat on for a minute here, in general, it takes about a year to really successfully um, instrument for open tracing. And that's why I heavily recommend if you can use something like Istio. Istio has almost virtually no overhead, use it because it's painful to go through tracing. We did this with our product, and it was massively painful to do this um, because the tracing you know, has some interesting characteristics. It's the spans, the tracing IDs, and all those things get set up for you, but how you read them and analyze them becomes more and more of a challenge. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh God. Do I have a one top strategy for reading out the red herrings? Uh, uh, lock your computer in a closed room and <laughs> unplug it. Um, that gets rid of almost every red herring you've ever seen. Um, so here's, here's actually the way I recommend. Generally speaking, you are going to see either an um, anomaly alert crossing a boundary or you're going to see an error, a headache alert. You're not going to see a lot of the other alerts happening. Very few people are actually doing tracing alerts at this point in time. If you see a headache alert, Ignore everything else and find out what caused that alert. The headache here, and the reason the secondary headache, especially in my space of microservices, is that the error can appear over here and the cause is over here. So, for instance, in our microservices world, we actually add an annotation every time we change every service that we can backtrace to. And it's no big deal, it's just timestamp, oh, this changed, so we can actually track back to it. It's quite often they show up as rate problems, unfortunately. And so rate problems basically say, oh, something doesn't look right, not that something's wrong. And so there, the next thing I do is I split all my code, my things out, and I look if anything's out of whack, pattern match, my own sense. If something's out of whack, I'll focus in on that. For instance, Web 6. Web 6, Web, Web 6 4, and 2, I believe, are the, the three inside of here. What's happening that's causing the rate problem here? It's not an error. Things are running. It's just not running the way I want them to run. And so I started drilling into that. I looked down into that rate functionality, and I said, okay, so what seems to be happening? I have a rate picture that says my overall rate looks like this, and this guy's eating a lot of it. And this was where it was sort of the experience model that said, go check your load balancer, uh, because your load balancer is probably screwed up. And so that's, that's kind of it. A lot of this right now is just pure investigation, hard, you know, code scene investigation, if you will, for this. Uh, by the way, I want this on the back of a jacket with reflective letters uh, <laughs> for this. But nonetheless, it really does come down to a lot of it is somewhat experience, and a lot of it is the ability to recognize things. Rate gives you the ability to recognize things in a common environment. So if you move from one to another, you're not going to have to figure out what's good and bad. You actually already know. But yeah, there's no magic trick that I can think of to do this. Um, I have great demos that can drill you right through in 30 seconds, but very honestly, I'll tell you right now, they're demos. Cool. cool. Well, um, we're, we've got a few more minutes to the next session, which is Jesse Butler. He's going to be talking about imposter syndrome here. Um, you're, are you, uh, Dave, yep. are you going to be around for the rest of the day? I will be around for the rest of the day. Um, okay. Come by, find me if you have questions. Be glad to chat with you at length about anything you want, including awesome. Shakespeare. Awesome. Thank you.